To be a parent is to be a protector. You want to keep your children safe and shield them from harm. But if a child goes missing and can't be found, oftentimes their parents will spend the rest of their lives looking for them. That is exactly what Robert Cook did following his daughter's disappearance. This is the case of Rachel Louise Cook. Before we begin today's case, I just wanted to remind everyone that if you have a case you want to see covered on this channel, I have a case suggestion link in the description box below. You will also find relevant case information like contact info and case numbers in the description box. If you would like to see the sources I used in today's case, you can find my sources pinned at the top of the comment section. Cases like Rachel's are all important and each deserves to be heard in its entirety, so please watch this video to the end to fully understand Rachel's story. Now on to today's case. Rachel Louise Cook was the eldest daughter of Robert and Janet Cook. She was a bright young woman who was accomplished at cross-country running and she enjoyed beauty pageants. Rachel had been studying at the San Diego Mesa College. She was interested in fashion design and was ultimately planning to transfer to a college in Los Angeles. In January of 2002, Rachel was home in the North Lake subdivision of Georgetown, Texas, visiting her family for the winter holidays. Rachel's boyfriend, Greg West, had traveled to Texas as well during the break, but he returned to California just before New Year's for work. It was the morning of January 10th, 2002, around 8 a.m. when Janet Cook passed her daughter in the living room. Janet was on her way to work and Rachel was still asleep on the couch. Around 9 a.m. that morning, Rachel spoke on the phone with her boyfriend and mentioned going for a run. This was business as usual for Rachel, who would often go on multiple mile runs. It's likely that she left her parents' house shortly after getting off the phone with Greg. Rachel was officially last seen around 11 to 11.30 that morning near Netch's Trail, which was only a couple hundred yards away from her parents' home. Rachel hasn't been seen since. Now, at 3 p.m. that day, Robert Cook returned home to pick up Rachel, who he had shopping plans with. When he arrived at the house, Rachel was nowhere to be found. Prior to moving away for college, Rachel had worked at the Wildlife Cafe, and she would often pick up shifts there in place of other people when she was home for holidays. She had already filled in for another person during this particular winter break, and so Rachel's mother called the restaurant that night when Rachel still hadn't returned home to ask if she was working. The person on the other line said that Rachel was indeed working that night, but it was later revealed to be a mix-up. A different girl by the name of Rachel had been working that night, but it was not Rachel Cook. Now, after this, Robert and Janet began to call Rachel's friends to find out if they had seen her that day. Then they called local hospitals to see if anyone named Rachel Cook or matching her appearance had actually been treated or admitted. Now, when police were contacted, they didn't take the case very seriously at first. Rachel was 19 years old at the time of her disappearance, and as an adult, she had every right to leave on her own accord. However, this theory wouldn't make sense. Rachel had spoken on the phone with her boyfriend that morning and hadn't mentioned anything about leaving. She was also planning on attending a wedding of a family member the next day, which she had been excited about. Rachel was also making plans to transfer colleges. Now, in addition to this, it was later confirmed that Rachel had never returned to her apartment in California or to her job at Hooters back in your campus. This lack of action on the part of police would greatly reduce the likelihood of ever finding Rachel. According to witnesses the day of Rachel's disappearance, there was a man driving a late model white or blue Chevrolet Camaro or Pontiac Trans Am with white or black stripes along the hood and the trunk. The person reported stopped and spoke with another female jogger that very same day. Descriptions of the man indicate that he was in his late teens or early 20s and he had slicked back black hair. He also had a darker complexion. There also may have been two other people inside the car with him driving around the neighborhood that day. Now, at one point, the car had been seen traveling along the Navajo Trail before turning southbound on Neches Trail, which was the last place where Rachel had been seen. In addition to this car, there was also possibly a white pickup truck that had been in the area that day. There may have been a wide, dark-colored stripe across the lower portion of this vehicle. 
Now, when Rachel disappeared, she had been wearing a gray running outfit with a green sports bra. She had on Asics running shoes and was carrying a yellow Walkman. Rachel stood at 5'3 tall and weighed approximately 115 pounds. She had blonde hair and blue or hazel eyes. She had a tattoo of two heart-shaped cherries on her left foot and her navel was pierced. She also had multiple ear piercings. Texas EquiSearch quickly became involved in the search for Rachel as well as the Travis County search and rescue team. Now, the first phase of search parties looked for Rachel for the first 24 days of her disappearance. And even after this, Rachel's father would help lead searches for months to come. A month after Rachel disappeared, a body was found near Waco, Texas. Janet had been called and informed by officers, but they did tell her that they didn't think it was likely to be Rachel. Janet let her husband know and he recorded in his online journal the following statement. The body turned out not to be Rachel, just as they thought. It was a relief. I say that, but sometimes I think, wouldn't it be better to be able to bury her than to not ever find out anything? I don't know the answer to that. I guess no one does. Six weeks after Rachel's disappearance, family and friends put together the Ride for Rachel event, where volunteers showed up to pick up flyers with Rachel's information and then drive around designated areas of nearby towns and cities to post the flyers everywhere possible. Within the first two months of the disappearance, Robert and Janet were already doing in-depth interviews with local news stations, as well as a coverage piece with Inside Edition. They were also already working on contacting Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted, and 2020 to get Rachel's case covered. In April of that year, a run walk for Rachel was organized to help keep her story in the news. Over 600 people signed up for the event and they raised around $10,000. Just a month later, on what would have been Rachel's 20th birthday, her family held a candlelight prayer service. The Wildlife Cafe donated a cake for the event, and friends and family members spoke to those gathered about Rachel and how they wouldn't give up looking for her. Following the disappearance of their daughter, Janet Cook used art to help her cope, and Robert Cook threw himself completely into the search for Rachel and into helping other families of missing loved ones. Robert was active in supporting missing persons groups, attending conferences, and even giving presentations about the impact that a disappearance has on loved ones. He even read books on serial killers in the hopes that it would give him ideas about where to search for Rachel and how to look at the case in a different way to help him figure out what might have happened. Now, the sheriff in Williamson County at the time of Rachel's disappearance was discovered to have a number of his own issues. He was eventually forced out of office during investigations related to serious misconduct and sexual harassment in the workplace. Now, the man who replaced him was Sheriff Robert Chody, who then started the department's missing persons unit and took over Rachel's cold case. When Rachel disappeared, her parents elected to participate in polygraph tests. Before I say anything further on that, I would like to mention that I have covered my views on polygraphs in a previous video dedicated to the topic. They are not a reliable means of detecting lies and falsehoods, and I strongly believe that polygraph results are not a good indicator of potential guilt or innocence. Now, I will leave a link in the description box down below to the video I did covering the history and science of polygraph machines if you are interested in that topic. With that out of the way, though, some of you may find it worth knowing that Rachel's father technically did fail his polygraph test. The only answer that the test picked up as a potential lie was when Robert was asked if he knew where Rachel was. He said no, but the machine said he wasn't telling the truth. However, Rachel's parents believe that this is because by the time they were taking the test, Robert believed that his daughter may already be dead and that she was in heaven. Sheriff Chody has publicly stated that he believes that this is indeed the case for Robert, and he has also said that they have no reason to believe that Rachel's parents are connected in any way to her disappearance. Eventually, Robert and Janet separated. Robert had put all of himself into Rachel's case, and it just wasn't something that Janet could keep doing, which is a completely valid way to feel about a situation like this. It wasn't that Janet had given up on Rachel or had stopped looking or hoping. She just couldn't cope with it being the only thing that she thought about and worked on 24-7. For her personal well-being, she had to take a step back from it and separate herself from it to feel as though she was healing. Now, in August of 2006, a criminal named Michael Keith Moore confessed to the murder of Rachel Cook. He claimed that he knocked Rachel unconscious during her jog and then drove her somewhere else where he sexually assaulted her before he killed her. He claims that he then wrapped her body in a tarp and weighed it down with rocks in the Matagorda Bay. 
Prison records do seem to indicate that Moore may have indeed been out of jail at the time of Rachel's disappearance. At the time that Moore gave his confession, he was already in jail for the murder of a pregnant woman. Moore had long been involved in crime, and he spent the majority of his adult life in prison. Now, Moore had originally agreed to plead guilty to the murder of Rachel Cook, but once he was in court, he pled not guilty before the judge. At this point, Moore claimed that he had been lying the entire time and was trying to get special treatment in jail in exchange for his cooperation. At the time, investigators believed that his confession was true, but the charges were ultimately dropped due to a lack of evidence and the confession having been rescinded. Following this, Rachel's case officially went cold. In 2014, Robert Cook passed away without ever knowing what had happened to his daughter. It wasn't until Sheriff Chody had started the Cold Cases Unit in 2016 that it was reopened. In July of 2017, there was a tip submitted that claimed that there were buried remains in a field that may belong to Rachel Cook. The area was searched, but nothing was turned up. Then in April of 2018, investigators impounded a car matching the description of one seen in Rachel's neighborhood that morning of her disappearance. So in September of that same year, it was announced that the car had actually tested positive for a possible presence of blood on the passenger side floorboard and a portion of the door molding. Since then, there have been no further official updates on the car. In addition to these updates in 2008, there was a ceremony and memorial tree planting outside of the Georgetown High School in honor of Rachel. Then, just earlier this year, 2020, the Williamson County Sheriff's Office released new sketches of persons of interest in Rachel's case. The sketches were released on the 18th anniversary of Rachel's disappearance, and they had been created by having the original witnesses sit down again with the sketch artist to refresh their visuals of the potential suspects. It was then reported in July 2020 that investigators had received an anonymous tip that they thought may be of value. They had reached out to news media to ask the tipster to contact them again to answer further questions. There hasn't been any word on whether or not the tipster has ever called back. In the first few years after Rachel's disappearance, her father kept an online journal at the suggestion of a local news agency who offered to host the journal on their site. The only way to read the entries today is to utilize the Wayback Machine and look at the archived website. Reading through Robert's journal and taking in the details of everything that he went through and everything that he did for Rachel and for other missing persons was heartbreaking, but I would highly suggest that everyone take the time to go and read it. I truly think that that journal is an important look into the life of a parent of a missing child. Since the reopening of Rachel's case, police have been dedicated to solving it. Sheriff Chody has said that the suspect list in the case is around 100 names long, and that the list does still include Michael Keith Moore. Police do strongly believe that the case will be solved one day. They just need that one right tip to come in and help crack it wide open. Rachel is still missing. No remains have ever been found, but it seems that police suspect that she is likely dead. If you have any information pertaining to Rachel's case, where she may be, and who may have taken her, I would strongly urge you to contact the Williamson County Sheriff's Office at 512-244-8631. So what are your thoughts on today's case? It seems pretty obvious to me that Rachel did not disappear of her own free will. I strongly believe that she was taken by someone while she was out on her run that day in 2002, but I do truly hope that we will see this case solved someday soon. Let me know what your thoughts are on the case in the comment section down below, but as always, remember to remain respectful. Please help me to keep this case in the public eye by sharing this video, someone else's video, or any of the sources provided, so that someday someone who may know something might come forward and help to crack the case wide open. Thank you so much for watching today's video, and I will see you again very soon for another case.